something which can be overlooked at times is the value of a true battle line battle mech. As odd as it sounds, quite often, designs will specialize a battle mech to such a degree that they can't function outside of their niche. War machines like the longbow, for instance, offer little outside of their intended role, and the same can be said for a multitude of other famous machines. By the time of the mid-3050s, many developers attempted to specialize as a way to market to house militaries and mercenaries. And while trooper machines, or battle line mechs, weren't forgotten, they weren't as center stage as they had once been during the Succession Wars. In this overview, we are going to examine a heavy mech, built by Erian Battle Mechs Unlimited, the largest arms manufacturer in the Free Worlds League, and arguably the third largest in the Inner Sphere, behind only Terra and Hesphorus. The Tempest. The road to the 65-ton brawler and battle line machine known as the Tempest begins, surprisingly, before the clan invasion. While the Inner Sphere was recovering from the events of the Third and Fourth Succession Wars, as well as the War of 3039, and after the discovery of the Helm Memory Core, and after efforts even prior to its discovery to rebuild the technological and industrial base of the Inner Sphere, even if it was at a gradual pace, the Free Worlds League in the 3040s began the process of designing a new heavy battle mech for the Free Worlds League military. First conceived as an intro tech design with as of right now not fully known specifications outside of its usage of a pair of PPCs, the TMP-2M Tempest didn't wow really anyone. It was late to the party for what it was. The League already had platforms like the long-established Warhammer series, or any number of other battle mechs that could fill the kinds of roles the TMP-2M was aimed towards. With the arrival of the techno-barbarian descendants of the Star League Defense Forces, the clans, this created a series of initiatives across the Inner Sphere to match these outsiders. Most principally, this arms race seemingly began to be undertaken by the Federated Commonwealth, the Draconis Combine, and Comstar. As you can guess, all of this had a knock-on effect in both the Free Worlds League and the Capellan Confederation. None benefited as much in terms of research, development, and industrialization during this race, more than the League. House Merrick had been a long-standing rival of the Lyran Commonwealth even prior to the Succession Wars, but they had always lagged behind their Steiner counterparts in technology, population, and overall industrial output, only holding back their Lyran adversaries, or launching wars of aggression themselves against their rivals with any degree of success, due to the slightly less horrid examples of gross nepotism and cronyism that existed within the Free Worlds League military, versus how Steiner's sphere-renowned, legendary, buffoonish, self-appointed military leaders. This is more than ironic, given that the Steiners view the League as being inherently corrupt, even more so than themselves. But at least as far as military affairs were concerned, the Merricks had a system that was slightly better at preventing fools from achieving too much power, likely only because they were less centralized than the Lyran State or the LCAF. Things began to change on the economic front first, with Captain General Janos Merrick's attempts at reform and centralization, and then at a much more accelerated rate when his son Thomas, as well as the false Thomas that represented him, came into the leading role in the Free Worlds League. In the latter's case, it was not only because of increasingly aggressive reforms, but also because the Free Worlds League was now a captured state by Comstar which silently provided them with increased direction and support. The Free Worlds League became a home for many of Comstar's operations as the state was dominated by the pair of Blakists at the top of it. Also, while the League's performance in the Fourth Succession War and the War of 3039 were far from fantastic, they weren't as poorly mismanaged as the Draconis Combine's efforts in the Fourth War, 
or the Capellan Confederations. This too meant that their state and its core industrial worlds, like Irian, were left in relatively good condition, meaning these planets were ideal for expanding their already impressive facilities. The Tempest 2M was an outdated design, conceived by a lagging, though increasingly powerful state in the 3040s. The Tempest never entered meaningful production in this state. By 3055, the League was now a military and industrial juggernaut forming in the Inner Sphere, having feasted upon the desperation of their allies and new trading partners. They were now in as much of the arms race as their Fedcom peers, too as despite not having to match the clans, they had to match their old foes, who were aiming to best the outsiders. Significant resources were poured into developing brand new, cutting edge, dangerous battle mechs. Multiple major companies were involved in this process, from weapons manufacturers through to full-on battle mech development firms. This directly benefited the now backwards Tempest battle mech, and it would undergo a massive overhaul to its core systems. Instead of being a late generation Succession Wars battle mech, aping already more successful, broadly produced Free Worlds League machines, it would become a unique, hard hitting, cutting edge, innovative inner sphere heavy mech design, filling the role of a new battle line war machine. Multiple advanced features were put into the platform and the results were unquestionably deadly. The mech was immediately considered by Free World's strategists to be the cornerstone for their growing and advancing military, leading to these being deployed across the League. The first to receive these deadly new mechs were any and all Federal forces as the machines became available, though Ducal Armies too would begin to receive them in quick order. They were purchased in such numbers that doctrinally it was normal to see them employed in numbers, deliberately. Entire companies of the Tempest would be at the center of newly equipped or created heavy mech formations, with older tried and tested medium mechs acting as screens and recon assets for them. After the discovery of House Steiner Davian's treachery in that they had failed to save the ailing Joshua Merrick, the firstborn son of the false Thomas Merrick, and that they had replaced him with a body double after his demise, relations more or less collapsed. The consequences of this would be a Free Worlds League and Capellan Confederation-led advance into the Federated Commonwealth in what was called Operation Guerrero. This collision would be the fiery testing grounds for the Tempest, where the battle mech proved its worth against the best that the League's enemies in House Steiner and Davian could throw at it, earning it a solid reputation amongst the armed forces. A true all-around combatant, it outfought and competed with equivalent mechs put on the field by the stunned defenders of the Federated Commonwealth. Guerrero would be such a catastrophic setback for House Steiner Davian that it would create the Chaos March. And worse, directly led to the FEDCOM Civil War. Since its arrival in 3055, and being proven in campaigns with bloody battles since, the Tempest has been displayed as being a powerful, smartly manufactured battering ram for the FWLM, and later its brief successor states. Its watch has yet to end as well, even into the Dark Age and Ill Clan eras. In fact, the mech would even find itself in the hands of the new Free Worlds League province, known as the Clan Protectorate, where its attributes were greatly enhanced, unleashing the storm's fullest potential. The first fully produced model of the Tempest, introduced in 3055 by Irian Battlemex Unlimited, the 65-ton heavy known as the TMP-3M, is an absolutely solid, hard-hitting battle mech, using the most advanced inner sphere technologies available in the 3050s for its construction. To begin our examination, the mech supports a standard gyro and cockpit, but also saves weight using inner sphere endo steel for its internal structure. This takes up a major portion of the mech's critical spaces, 
and prevents it more or less from using any advanced armor types for the era it was constructed in, but it is well worth the trouble for the battle mech to save three tons, considering it would be stressed to use all of its onboard critical space regardless, minus if it had specialized plating. Once we get into cooling, we can see that the 3M has inner sphere double heat sinks, a great boon for the battle mech, and it's got 11 of them in total, letting it dump 22 heat every turn. This is more than adequate for an inner sphere heavy as armed as the TMP, though it isn't fully heat neutral and will have to bracket and cycle weapons fire as needed in combat conditions. As far as electronics are concerned, the Tempest is equipped with an Erian Technologies HMR-35S communications package and a Wasat Watchdog W100 targeting and tracking system. To get into the machine's quirks, the Tempest merely has a directional torso mount for its head-based weapon system. In other words, it doesn't really suffer from anything and has very minimal benefits when using the advanced rules. Looking into the Tempest's ability to move on the battlefield, the mech has a smart arrangement for its engine and other systems, given the technology available to Erion at the time of its construction. To get this mech moving, it has a 7-ton Magna 260XL fusion engine, giving the Tempest a maximum speed of 64 km per hour, which translates into 6 movement points in the tabletop game. This speed is adequate for an inner sphere battle line heavy, as it moves at the expected motion for a mech of its weight class, and saves 7 tons of space as compared to the non-XL version of this engine. Now, XL engines in general do make the mech more susceptible to engine death through the loss of a side torso of the mech in combat or through additional exposure to incoming critical hits, but this is a price that inner sphere mechs often have to pay to onboard advanced weapon systems, like the Tempest does. XL engine aside, its mobility is further enhanced by its four Chilton 465 jump jets. This gives it the ability to leap up to 120 meters in a single bound, and adds a level of mobility to the mech, allowing it to more easily traverse difficult terrain or urban environments, giving it an edge in such conditions, or when needing to quickly reposition. Overall, the movement profile of the Tempest complements its other aspects, giving it a strong position in heavy formations, and letting it be agile enough to keep up with its enemies in battle. Physical protection is vital for the Tempest, as it must prevent the harm of its sensitive onboard components, whether that be in the form of ammunition, its engine, or its volatile weapon systems. Its hardened outer shell is comprised of Maximilian 100 standard armor plating, as it simply doesn't have the critical space on board due to its inner sphere endo steel frame to use anything but this. Overall, the endo is the better choice, because that saves more tonnage than the enhanced armor. The TMP3M has 12.5 tons of this material, yielding it 200 points of protection. Beyond its ability to use its jump jets or mobility to enhance its defense through movement bonuses or using terrain to its advantage, this is it for its capabilities to guard itself. This means that the Tempest actually does have somewhat of a problem, as it can be knocked out by a catastrophic ammunition explosion due to it not having a case, as it does have exposed ammunition. An XL engine, as well as its primary cannon that could all cause the mech to be catastrophically destroyed. This means that if its respectable armor is diminished, and then stripped, it can be removed quickly from the battle, more quickly than other designs even. Still, it is decently defended for the era of its production, but it's not without its shortcomings. And this is something its pilots and commanders should be aware of, and will have to do everything they can to mitigate them. The biggest standout part of the Tempest is its diverse and powerful set of weapons. It can compete in any range bracket, and strike with a force that most inner sphere heavies would struggle to keep up with, even during the 3050s. In other words, this smartly and heavily gunned battle mech brings a storm of fire to anyone who tries to engage it. To start with, as its primary armament, it has a right arm mounted Zeus slingshot gauss rifle. This weapon is probably the most dangerous one made by the inner sphere at the time, with an exceptional range and delivery of a fight ending 15 damage per round of fire, 
It has two tons of ammunition for this killer cannon, or 16 rounds, and it operates optimally at long, medium, or even close ranges, despite the hindrance of a small minimum range bracket. Its almost negligible heat generation as well means that this gun can be fired every turn without consequence. It is volatile if it's damaged in combat, however, which is its primary drawback. After this, everything starts converging on its close-range capabilities. First, for accurate fire in close, it has a left-arm-mounted Sutel Precision Line Large Pulse Laser. While this is by no means as powerful as its clan counterpart, it still does accurate fire in close, and hits with almost the same force as a PPC. When combined with its Gauss Rifle, the pair will shred enemy armor accurately at close and medium ranges. Moving into its secondary weapon systems, it backs these up with three Diplan M3 medium lasers, with two in the center torso and one in the head. Realistically, the mech can run, fire all three of its medium lasers and its primary weapons every turn and remain heat neutral, meaning it's a very mean fighter in close under the right conditions, being able to tear into enemy armor and cut openings for scatter weapons to exploit. By the way, it does indeed have one of those, in the form of its Erian Weapons Work 60mm SRM-6 rack that is found in its left torso. This launcher has one ton of ammunition too, that gives it 15 shots in game. After its targets have been battered and exposed, this SRM launcher will shotgun down weakened targets, though firing it with all of its other systems will start overheating the mech but typically not enough to suffer a full penalty in a single turn. This means if the mech is managed smartly, it can unleash devastating waves of fire at the right moment to cement its opponent's doom in battle. The Tempest truly is the storm as a result. When looking at the Armored Triangle, the Tempest does many jobs well enough to make it a great all-around battle mech. It moves at a moderate, expected speed for its battlefield role and weight, and has enhanced versatility in this space by being able to meaningfully jump. It is plated heavily for its size. It is cooled enough and heavily gunned enough to make even clan mechs think twice about engaging this powerful heavy without taking it seriously. But all of this has a price. The mech is expensive in terms of its production cost and to some degree its battle value. Its heavy armor conceals a very potentially explosive set of internal systems, with no real safety measures to keep the mech from being downed by a calamity. Its XL engine further adds to its potential ability to be knocked out in a fight early. Finally, it is heavily gunned and even decently cooled, but if a pilot is overzealous, they can and will generate heat issues for the mech, meaning it needs to be managed appropriately. I've said it before and I will say it again. You don't need to alpha strike every single turn. Still, when measuring its strengths and its flaws, you will still find a powerful, dangerous, and very capable heavy mech on the battlefield. It has a ruthless and dangerous reputation, and one that has followed it for generations after its introduction. First introduced in 3134, the TMP-4M is a pretty major refit of the original. While there were several other variants produced after the original TMP-3M, these were very simple changes in many respects. While the 4M represents the introduction of not only changes to its weapons package, but also how it operates overall, through enhanced mobility. The 4M retains its original armor, engine, and general internal configurations. Changes begin with the reduction of its double heat sinks from 11 to 10. This is fairly minimal as far as mech systems go, but the real changes are from its removal of the missile system on board, in favor of using that system's weight, as well as the saved ton on heat sinks, to upgrade its jump jets to improved jump jets, and upping its overall leaping capability to 5. This means that the TMP-4M can leap up to 150 meters per turn, making it able to jump almost as far as it can run, and this allows it to generate more significant defensive bonuses from jumping alone. It also gives it a greater ability to reposition in order to gain a tactical edge over its opponents. Beyond this, it retains its Gauss Rifle and medium lasers, though it installs a snub-nose PPC in place of its large pulse laser. 
Overall, the 4M is a very valid alternative to the base 3M model, and has its own virtues, but the most notable one is its ability to jump 5. Never underestimate how powerful of a bonus a 3 harder to hit is in combat, especially when things start getting close in. The most powerful configuration of the Tempest to date, the Tempest C, a product of 3140, is a Clan Protectorate upgrade of the original Eryan model. This powerful, robust battle mech is more than capable of downing anyone foolish enough to disregard its presence on the battlefield, taking what made the original Tempest such a great machine and enhancing it. The base chassis remains a little changed, as it still uses Inner Sphere Endo Steel, and an Inner Sphere XL engine, and even Inner Sphere double heat sinks. In the case of the latter, it has 12 doubles now, increasing its cooling to 24. But the real changes come in its heavily augmented weapons package. First, it upgrades to a clan quality gauss rifle, saving on weight, as well as a clan quality large pulse laser. For the pulse laser, this doubles its range and improves its damage, making it an excellent long range pairing for its gauss rifle. The saved weight from all of this then allows it to upgrade its SRM-6 to an ATM-9, which is exceptionally powerful. The ATM missiles are considered in the running for being the best missile launchers in the game, and it does have two tons of ammunition for this brutal launcher, letting it carry, if the pilot needs it, several types of missiles. Without question, this Tempest is a brutal machine. It still lacks any kind of case, which may cause problems for it, but it is without a doubt the deadliest of Tempests on the battlefield, and an excellent compromise between Inner Sphere and Clan technologies. This creates a more budget-friendly battle mech for the Protectorate, only with killer Clan capabilities. The Clan Invasion era accelerated development and advancement in the Inner Sphere at the fastest rate seen since the Star League itself ruled over human space with an iron grip. The Great Houses, no longer restricted by Comstar or by their immediate tensions and destructive attacks on one another in the open, began a fierce competition to create the deadliest machines to strike back at the Clan Invaders, but also to potentially guard against one another. The Tempest is one of the best examples of this and shows some of the most forward-thinking and cunning engineering choices a battle mech from this era could find. It's a shame that so few know of it, and its full potential. As for many, Battletech's exposure for them comes to a close, with only the classical designs from the Clan Invasion and Succession Wars. Technical Renote 3055 opens a window to many fascinating ideas, or just solid upgrades and really shows the Great Houses flexing their intellectual muscles. Surviving for a century since its introduction, coming in many forms, and still holding up even in the deadly Blakist era through to the Ill Clan era, the Tempest is a solid, brutal combatant on any battlefield. In fact, its smart design would even make it a contender against some of the most feared opponents it may come up against. The Free Worlds League and EarTech truly found the eye in the hurricane when they conceived, manufactured, and deployed this brutal heavy mech. Henceforth, and for the duration of the crisis, Parliament shall gather and disband, as the Captain General deems fit. Thank you all for joining me here today. It took a little while longer than I would like to get the Tempest out. Life's just been a little bit busy. There's been a lot of things going on in the background recently in terms of dealing with things like art for the channel or art for different videos, as well as planning out future content. I actually have to record this part just to remind people, because I forgot, there is always a top 
post that I put into my videos that has a full list of the resources that I used to make the video in question. In this case, for The Tempest, I used several source books, and you will find them there, and I will also have a link to Iron Wind Metals, because you can still get The Tempest directly through Iron Wind Metals, even if there isn't a plastic version of it right now. If you enjoyed this video, don't forget to quote, smash the like button, unquote. And if you're new here, don't forget to subscribe. I produce Battletech content pretty frequently, and you'll enjoy it, I'm pretty sure. I also want to give a huge shout out to every single one of the YouTube channel members. You guys literally make all of this happen. If it weren't for you guys, I wouldn't be able to produce these videos the way I do. There's going to be more content coming. Next up, it is planned for me to be covering SRM carriers, LRM carriers, and MRM carriers in a single missile platform based video. I've also got the Warhammer 2C video on the horizon, which I showed off a little bit of the audio for the other day on stream. With that being said, what do you all think of The Tempest? Please let me know, and I'll catch you all in the comments section below.